Hello there, and welcome to everyone joining us for this latest IoT Central webinar. I'm Clive Maxfield, everyone calls me Max, and I'll be your host. In addition to being a practicing engineer, I also act as a technology consultant, author, speaker, and educator. I'd like to start our webinar today by thanking Keegan for sponsoring today's event. Keegan is a leading supporter of the IoT Central community, and we're grateful to have them as sponsors. Joining us will be panelists from Edge Impulse, 451 Research, and Flex, who I will be introducing shortly. Today's webinar is entitled Accelerating Innovation on the IoT Edge with Integrated SIM. In this webinar, you'll learn how to navigate through the choices across SIM, eSIM, and iSIM, and what's best for your product. Uh, we'll see quick start tools and cool demos that can move you from concept to product, and we'll experience the supercharged potential of tiny ML and iSIM. So before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's proceedings. This event will be one hour long. We have four panel members who I'll introduce in just a moment. There will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session following our main discussions. And this event is being recorded and it will be available on iotcentral.io tomorrow. So on behalf of Keegan, I would like to invite our att attendees to share with their social networks that they are in fact attending. And also to feel free to share your thoughts on today's topic using the hashtag future of sim one word after today's event i'd also like to encourage you to provide questions throughout the presentation and i will be reviewing and presenting these questions to our panelists on your behalf in the q a session now i'm very pleased to introduce today's panel members brian partridge is a research director for the applied infrastructure and devops and cloud native technologies research channels at 451 research which is a part of s p global market intelligence in these roles brian has overall responsibility for channel research deliverables and team management as a researcher he actively contributes to the internet of things 5g edge computing mobility and enterprise networking domains Loic bonvale oversees product management and marketing for keegan he drives the entire Keegan portfolio from embedded solutions to services. Loic has more than 20 years of experience in telecoms, wireless, security, and the IoT in development, support, technical sales, and product marketing. Juan Nagada is director of the Center of Excellence for Wireless and Connectivity at Flex. In this role, he is defining technology roadmaps, evaluating new innovative solutions, establishing strategic collaborations with partner companies and leading internal research programs in the field of wireless communication and finally Yan Yangboom is the CTO and co-founder of Edge Impulse which enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent devices with embedded machine learning Yan is an embedded engineer who likes to explore the boundary between the digital and physical worlds and to do unexpected things with hardware. So with that, it's time to commence our presentation. Brian, at this time, I'd like to ask you to start us off as soon as you're ready. Super. Yeah, so if we can move to the next slide, I just wanted to, and first of all, let me join Max and, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. At 451 Research, um, Internet of Things is a key area of focus, and we have an entire practice uh, built around the topic. One of the things that we do as part of that practice is, um, on a quarterly basis, we go out and survey IoT decision makers to understand where, where they are relative to, to a number of different topics and investigations. And so this data was collected in 2020. Uh, on the left side of the chart here, we've got uh, an indication of, of where um, our respondent base is, and these are across uh, a variety of vertical markets and typically the uh, the IT decision maker role. We can see about 37% of enterprises we survey are considering themselves in production with IoT, and literally all of the other um, elements here are some, some phase of, of the pre-production um, 
and deployment phase of IoT. In the middle chart here, we see the types of IoT endpoints that are being deployed beyond data center facilities and IT equipment. We can see here that uh, cameras and surveillance equipment is uh, is leading in second place and buildings and other structures is coming in third. We've also captured uh, the total number of endpoints uh, here. So we can see that, um, you know, in general, some the, these deployments we would still consider smallish. Uh, majority here are under 5,000 in total devices. Of course, we have some um, up at the higher end of there as well. And then the last uh, piece of data here uh, below the endpoint data is the is the expected increases. And we can see here that uh, this is a market that's still expected to to increase in, in terms of device uh, devices on that on average expected to grow uh, by 65 percent. While I don't have data on here around COVID, one of the things that um, that you may be interested in is just understanding how COVID is impacting uh, the marketplace. And and to net it about to net it out, COVID really has been. Um, has been, if anything, an accelerator. About 25% of respondents has really had no changes as a result of COVID. About 35% of, of this respondent base indicate that they're actually uh, uh, accelerating IoT investments. And only 3% actually indicated that they're stopping, pro stopping uh, IoT uh, projects in production. So in summary here, I would say that despite the fact that a lot of the underlying IoT technologies have matured to extent, this is still a market in the earlier stages of the development and with some significant growth ahead. If we move to the next chart, you know, as the topic for today is around connectivity, my next two data points will address connectivity issues. Uh, so this first data point here is asking the question, for which, for which of the following reasons would your organization consider changing or adding new connectivity mem uh, vendors to the existing mix? And we think that a lot of these um, are potentially relevant to the eSIM, iSIM discussion here. We see that the top reason for considering a change in IoT is, is about new technical requirements. So these could be issues like dealing with uh, issues like permanent roaming, or specific connect connectivity performance. The second most popular answer here was about uh, bundling compute or, or, or having a requirement to actually get a full application stack with connectivity services. So that may imply a business model change moving to things like uh, outcome as a service. Some of these other reasons um, here, lower cost or a multi-vendor approach to connectivity also have direct relevance around this, this SIM uh, architecture discussion. Like if you go to the next slide, yeah. So IoT connectivity trends. So, um, so, so two data points here to to look at. On the left side, we're asking about the types of connectivity technologies that are in use today for IoT connections and how they expect that to trend for uh, in two years. One one thing that really jumps out of the page is the expectation around 5G. Uh, technology. Um, so 65% of, of respondents are expecting that 5G will be um, a connectivity, uh, one of the more popular connectivity methods in use. We see that that's um, come slightly at the expense of, of Wi-Fi and of course uh, 4G and LTE. On the right side of the chart, we're, we're asking, we're zooming out a bit and, and not only understanding connectivity type, but also public versus private deployment. And um, and what we see here is that for the, the 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 most popular answer is that a public network service, um, uh, broadband LTE or 5G. So that is a, a service that would be acquired by an, a telecom operator or an MVNO, um, for that matter, is 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 the most popular choice. And we can see where the where the other uh, the others land on it there too. So uh, of course, private LTE and 5G is a is a key sort of uh, consideration for people that are running industrial enterprises or industrial locations. And we see the uh, the the uh, maybe surprising is the 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 least popular choice were were the um, narrowband uh, technologies. So with that uh, context, let me pass it to Loic. He's going to, to to take the ball from here. All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. So um, 
thanks for these good insights, right? I think uh, one of the key points that emerged from that is uh, notably the need for, uh, you know, uh, more intelligence, uh, more intelligence at the edge. And, and the point we want to make today is uh, really to say that there is a, a convergence between the need for higher security and also the the growth of uh, the, uh, the intelligence at the edge, right? So. Uh, what what we've seen lately is uh, is a strong need for uh, you know lesser uh, no notably power consumption lesser uh, a lesser impact on the on the environment notably uh, for data transmission and uh, from there also we've seen a lot of capabilities growing at the edge uh, right in the form of uh, uh, ML solutions running into very small footprint uh, processors, right? So this, uh, uh, this triggers definitely uh, an interesting need, which is uh, protecting uh, more this edge with all the intelligence that's going into it. Typically, we'll see more and more companies uh, effectively uh, trying to embed really their knowledge, their, their, their vertical knowledge into their device bringing more insight into the on-device analysis, right? And uh, Jan will talk a lot about that at the end of the presentation, uh, and how we can effectively protect that through, uh, through solutions uh, that uh, Keegan can deliver, notably through ICIM, right? So uh, just a few key, um, key reminder uh, about our value proposition at Keegan, right? Uh, we are focusing on integrating security as a cornerstone of innovation. What do we mean by that, right? We, we want to enable simpler access to cellular, uh, providing, uh, helping through our ecosystem of partners to provide a, a vast choice of uh, chipset of cellular module that are pretty much ready to connect, embed security, and embed processing capabilities, right? And that's one of the things that really I see is enabling today uh, is uh, providing from the inception of the chipset effectively, right? Uh, the security and the needed protection so that people can deploy in confidence device in the field and notably over cellular network. Uh, with I see we really want to, to enable the, uh, both the network authentication, right? The classical function of a SIM card, as well as the applicative security that is really needed uh, to authentify devices into various clouds, for example, or into your, your own backend for your solution. So we are really keen to um, have this available really from the early stage of the supply chain. And that's really our, our core mission uh, that, that we want to enable. Just here, I um, want to bring up a few key, uh, for example, verticals that can definitely benefit from this type of integration, right? So you see here safety, logistics, smart cities, infrastructure, health care. For safety, uh, several key simple examples, right? You, you can think, and especially in, the, in these COVID times, right? Uh, protection of the elderly people, right? You see more uh, a need for autonomous, working on their own devices which, which can warn about conditions, which can, which can warn in whole uh, with, a, with a strong level of security, uh, fashion conditions, a variation in their conditions, and, uh, and enable that in a really uh, smart way thanks to uh, ML algorithm, notably directly embedded inside the devices, right? So for that specific use case for safety and also healthcare in a way, uh, you really want the maximum privacy and security embedded from the get going to your devices. And for companies who want to be successful in that domain, that's really an essential part of their value proposition. Um, in logistics, so logistics is a well-known uh, domain and area of the uh, cellular IoT, right? With uh, tracking of cars, notably tracking of assets. But we see a growing need for um, smart uh, tracking of assets at low cost, right? And here, ICIM has been enabling uh, innovation uh, thanks to a, a very tight integration and embedded security 
uh, with uh, smart label, for example, as seen as 2.5 millimeter, which can be effectively printed, right? That's another concrete example of what type of innovation I think can bring to this type of devices. Smart city infrastructure, well, a lot of activities in the smart metering space, notably. Um, so, moving on to why does ISTEAM uh, offer the ultimate security foundations? Right, ISTEAM is a natural evolution of the plastic SIM and eSIM, right? It leverages the same strong security dedicated hardware that runs secure algorithm to basically authenticate a device to a network and provide also security for the application. Few numbers here. Uh, in specific use cases, you, you see a definite big power consumption reduction, uh, specifically when, when it relates to the SIM card. The form factor is an obvious gain. And when it's well integrated, we can see uh, up to 10x performance improvement over a classical SIM, right? Uh, when we compare that to a classical plastic SIM. So these are the key, some of the key elements that, uh, that can bring benefits uh, uh, to the OEMs who want really to leverage cellular. And, and I think we now see a new breed of OEMs and companies going cellular because of uh, the available innovation. And now I'll uh, hand over to Juan who can tell you more about notably the iEnable board and how uh, this can help OEM to develop their products. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Lloyd, and uh, thank you, Keegan, for hosting me hoy, uh, today here. And um, thank you for the, all the audience to join. Just want to remind uh, everybody that, uh, of course, we, we are willing to to receive your questions that you can submit in the in the chat, in the in the application. <clears throat> so uh, just go to the next next slide, uh, Lloyd, please. So I think if, if you ever try to bring an IoT idea to the to the market, um, you will find the process represented in this picture very familiar. So and based on our experience, um, only few only few customers has a clear concept on how to implement the concept they have in mind in the IoT space. So therefore, after the the, the IoT concept or the IoT idea, they come uh, they come to to us. There is a costly and long-term iterative process uh, that you know uh, force you to define, prototype, a program, and then test the solution uh, before you know going a couple of times or three times around this uh, this iterative process until you are ready uh, for industrialization and to be scaled. You know? So many questions like uh, which sensors do I uh, do I need for this application? Which connectivity? fits better to my use case uh, is uh, machine learning a, a technology that i could uh, apply here these are only some of the questions that um, you have to answer and you can you only really can answer these questions if you do a small scale a field test you know a real test on the field uh, of course i mean you can use a, an arduino type of board and then you put some sensors and add some connectivity shields to build a, a quick proof of concept but this cannot be brought to the to the real world to verify that the business model uh, of your IoT idea is valid and that it can scale. You know? So with the with the this idea in mind to to the idea in mind to reduce to to or to, to simplify this this bubble in the middle. At Flex, we we designed it the I enabler, and together with our partners Keegan and Sony and Murata. We added also the iSIM uh, technologies to, to create the iSIM I enabler. So uh, look like the next slide. So it's, uh, the 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 I enabler is a uh, um, um, a bunch of sensors and connectivity solutions plus iSIM technology, packed in a small ruggedized enclosure, which allows you to quickly a move from your idea to a field test in uh, just doing a, a small uh, programming activity. You know? So you can use our SDK and then quickly quickly program your uh, solution and then pass uh, quickly to to a field uh, to a field test with uh, some of these devices. You know? So just go to the next uh, slide. 
So the idea is that you, you use uh, the I enabler, I see my enabler to program your application. Then you do a, a small scale uh, filters where you can really tune your application, you know, with really verify which sensors do you need. Is this connectivity the one you want to use or do you want to try a different one? Um, capture, capture data to see if uh, machine learning is valid can you apply machine learning on the edge or do you need to apply it on, on the cloud so all these um answers all these questions you need to answer before doing a quick customization optimization before going to to industrialization and to scale and that's a good thing because as the i enabler this 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 process takes um, a, a, a few time because as I enabler has been designed by Flex, of course, has been designed for manufacturing. So this transition from the field test to the industrialization, it takes a few time in comparison to a complete product design cycle. Yeah, and this was um, the, the, the presentation about the I enabler. So it's a, a, um, an excellent tool to test all these um, IoT solutions, including now uh, easy way to test the ICM technology. And I hand over now to, to Jan. Thank you. <laughs> almost, almost breaking something here. Hi, uh, Mian. Um, so you might think, isn't that a bit weird? Um, I thought we were having a, a webinar about ICM. What is this guy talking about machine learning all of a sudden? So let me tell you a little bit of where, where I came from. So I built, I was an operating systems engineer on mobile phones for a long time. and I think like like a lot of the, a lot of people that are considering building connected devices, at some point you realize that you can never actually get the battery life out of a mobile phone chipset that you actually want in a real deployment here. So I started working on embedded systems, uh, ended up at ARM, and was kind of really here on on the beginning of this frontier of IoT solutions. And while we see the volumes coming, I think Brian had some some great insights uh, early on about kind of the devices that people start shipping. We started seeing lots and lots of companies going from, you know, they've gone through the POC stage and are actually rolling this out. That's great. And now I'm disappointed about what these devices do. Like lots of these IT devices are literally just temperature sensor, measures temperature once an hour, and then sends it nicely over over our fancy cellular networks um, to central location. Um, and it's relatively low value use cases. So we started thinking, okay, what can we do actually to do to start covering higher value use cases? And to do that, we need to be able to sense much more than our standard sensor can do. We need our device to actually feel, hear, and see, and really understand everything happening around us, whether that's you know, feeling or having an asset that actually knows when it's being loaded onto a car, rather than just, oh, it's moving, but it might still be in a warehouse. Um, if I have a sensor on an animal to see when it's actually in danger and, and being able to respond to that. Um, or uh, actually visually inspecting a site, like are there actually humans walking in an area where they, where they couldn't be? Um, so I found a new company, Edge Impulse, and Edge Impulse is a developer platform built by engineers for engineers um, to build machine learning solutions that use sensor data in the broadest sense, uh, literally anything from accelerometer to microphones, like the, the device that uh, Yuan showed just now is perfect for this type of stuff. So we'll help developers actually collect data, um, learn from the data, either through normal signal processing or you know new fancy machine learning techniques like neural networks, and then help deploy that to any type of embedded device. So the, the little two and a half millimeter thick uh, sticker that, uh, that Keegan has been making. I don't know if there's, if there's going to be a slide about it at a later point. Beautiful little target. That that type of device we can actually deploy machine learning on. Really cool. Um, so I think the big the big thing here is that with iSIM, we can actually lower the cost of devices, which is really cool. Um, we can build smaller devices. And I think once we add a little bit of machine learning to that, we can actually make these devices do some really useful things as well. So that's why I'm really happy to be here. And I'll hand it back thanks to Mike, I think. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, so just to conclude this uh, small presentation, right, but I think uh, with uh, the three companies present here, we are on, we are on a similar mission, right? All in, in, all in, our, in our own role, right, which is 
simplifying and democratizing access to cellular IoT and enabling more function at the edge, right? Uh, Flex brings uh, this uh, uh, designable board combining, you know, the iSIM, combining the capabilities to run tiny ML functions and run a framework such as uh, Edge Impulse. And we've seen that, uh, I would say, the market forces are, are shaping pretty well into uh, high level of adoption of new type of devices. I think that's really the interesting piece is because we try to remove this complexity, we see new players coming to cellular, which have been, uh, and I've been in this field for, for quite some time, is being dominated by a lot of major players for many years, but now we start to see new companies uh, really coming into the play of bringing you know, additional value to their device. And I think it's really uh, this important point is what is connectivity and machine learning and security will bring to your value and to your vertical expertise. Uh, that, is, that is really the important things to, to keep in mind, right? And first and foremost, your product and your vertical is, is the most important things to, to consider. So with that, I will hand over to back to Max uh, for the next steps of uh, this uh, one-hour show. Thank you, Yoik. Um, and thanks to all of our panel members for a very interesting discussion. Um, I think this is really all the, the cutting edge of what's going on these days. Uh, before we get to the Q&A portion, we do have two quick polls. Uh, so we'll just wait for the first one to come up. So uh, if you could answer this by clicking on your interface, in which industry segments would you like to use iEnable with machine learning applications? And as you see, the options are logistics, medical, industrial, or telematics. I'm going to give you just a couple of settings there to click the buttons, and uh, then we will present the answers or the, the tally of the results. The faster you click, the faster I can get back to you. Okay, so logistics 18%, medical 24%, industrial 34%, uh, and telematics 23%. And that actually sort of ties in pretty much with what I was thinking, but then I, I'm more from an industrial background, so that sort of makes sense to me. Uh, okay, and uh, now on to our second poll question, um, which is, I'll wait for it to appear on the screen. Uh, would you like to engage with Keegan to take advantage of iSIM and machine learning capabilities with iEnable? Uh, and the options here are simple. Yes, please, or no, thank you. <laughs> so we'll give you a few seconds to, um, to answer that. And then we will continue with the questions and answers portion. Um, I'm watching the questions flood in here. But you've still got time, so uh, this would be a great time for you to post your questions. And any questions we don't have time to get to today, uh, we will uh, follow up with you later. Okay, so now let's get started with today's question and answer session. Uh, I want to thank you all for your participation. As I see, we've got some great uh, questions that are coming through the presentation. And we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. Uh, actually, I do have a couple of questions of my own. So I'm going to mix all of these questions together. Uh, and since I'm currently in charge, let's start with one of mine. Uh, what are the key considerations that are shaping the IoT edge? Uh, Brian, let's start with you. Sure, just coming off mute here. Yeah, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, I think a lot of the technology building blocks are really uh, there and, and have reached a level of maturity. 
Um, so people need to be co feel comfortable about the technology component of this. I think where things tend to um, fall down is is around the the upfront understanding, planning, and collaboration that needs to happen around the target business outcomes. And unless those are well understood and they can be tracked with the right KPIs, um, a lot of this stuff gets sort of gummed up in the the POC and sort of test mode. So I think that um, that one of the things that's driving that is is a, a growing understanding that this is really important and so those companies that can organize themselves around bringing the right stakeholders together uh, including people on the financial side uh, potentially uh, and, and really getting a good picture of what that needs to look like um, I, I think that that again is driving the decisions and, and for those that are are really pushing the gas and accelerating um, with IoT projects, edge enabled, and so forth, that's a, um, I think that's a, a key sort of common thread that we see across all of them. I think another thing to, just to throw in there that, that, that drives some of the decision can be data gravity. So the extent that organizations may be already engaging with a particular hyperscale cloud, uh, for instance, is is also potentially a reason why someone may make a a particular choice around the uh, the actual stack itself. No, thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, Yoink, same question. What are the key considerations that are shaping the IoT edge? So, I think yeah, the I would echo uh, Brian's first. Ah, we've lost Yoink. So while we're waiting for Yoit to come back and join us, uh, you know, one of the problems with these online uh, communications, uh, Juan, can we ask you the same question? What are the key considerations that are shaping the IoT edge? Well, I think um, the, the considerations are already has more or less agreed with, with Brian on those on those topics. Uh, like is like is back. Well, you you you're talking now. You you can okay okay. In. But no problem. Just um, then I think the the the, the it's, it's very important to 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 have uh, all the elements you know available um, at the beginning to when the IoT uh, concept is being prepared. You know? So you you have the possibility to take the decision uh, to to do uh, the processing on the edge instead of moving everything to the cloud actually you will need to bring back everything from the cloud as which has been moved in the last years to be done there you know so um i think there, there is uh, for me there is uh, one one important key to be able to to implement uh, the iot on the edge is um you know uh, is knowledge you know on on the on machine learning on on processing you know on on power on, on low power uh, these are um i would say buzzwords or keywords that everybody mentioned about low power you know uh, so all, all this uh, stuff but at the end of the day if you look at the what is on the market there's no devices which is really low power nobody has spent uh, you know an effort in really reduce the power of the devices you know and 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 they at the end of the day and we see this in our customers, you know, um, they prefer to put a bigger battery, you know, instead of uh, um, spend uh, time in reducing this, this uh, low power. So I think the, the key enablers of having the really IoT on the edge is experience. You know, I think it's a big, a big, um, a big, uh, a big word, but this is very important experience in the key elements. Uh, like low power, like machine learning, like computing, which needs to be implemented on the on the on the hardware. It's also also to know a little bit about hardware, because mm -hmm. it seems at the end of the day, uh, just just doing software, uh, you can you can do everything, but you have to really know the hardware you are uh, using to to be able to apply all this uh, to, to really bring the IoT to the edge. So uh, if, I, if I can build upon upon Yuan's uh, thing, so what is an interesting thing is what we've seen with some customers is if you are going to deploy cellular connectivity, you you 
you'll need to do some duty cycling here because you know if you're going to run the run the radio for 48 hours you better use that and one of the really cool things of where our customers are deploying some machine learning is actually knowing much more intelligently on when the device is waking up. So with uh, with Iso Electro, it's a grid monitoring com or a grid company, electric grid company. So they have um, on their electricity masts, they have devices sitting and they're actually constantly monitoring, no connectivity required. And only if something goes wrong, cool, I'll run the radio, I'll send it over. Same in S tracking. If rather than having to wake up every hour, get a GPS location, and then send it over a network, I know when, okay, now I'm actually out of the warehouse, and I feel that I'm on a car or, or in a place where actually something interesting is happening. That's when we can set, start sending stuff out. So I think that is a really cool intersection that, that we can explore already today of, of ML plus cellular connectivity. And then you know, the additional benefit of lower power with iSIM is, is just, just a nice thing extra to have. Now, Joik, I'm assuming that you weren't trying to avoid answering the question when you disappeared. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure really what happened there, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm back. So hopefully you can hear me loud and clear there. So, yeah, just to reiterate maybe quickly my point, right, is, uh, yeah, no really first you're, you're really, what, what ROI and benefit you want is the first, first and foremost most important version in my mind, but for sure, uh, then, uh, trying to select, you know, uh, especially if you're new to cellular integrated solution and hardware, I think it making sense. I would say proven block that works together, right? And that's, for example, what uh, what Flex brings to the table here is that you can leverage, uh, you know, a first proof of concept, trying to test, uh, you know, uh, your use cases, et cetera, with a bunch of sensor, experiment, validate, and then move on to build your own device. I've seen too often also, I think sometimes people jumping head on, on I'm gonna do a technical design and I'm just gonna jump there and do my final device. And, and this, is, this is tough to do, right? So it's good to, to take iterative steps through that process and really, uh, really run through you know, uh, POCs that are easy to, to start. Uh, and uh, using pre-integrated element, I think, is the is right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, actually, I agree. And I'd also like to follow back on what uh, Juan said earlier on. It is important to know the hardware. Uh, a lot of people are running around, like you say, obviously software is really important. But if you don't know how the hardware behaves in the real world, you can have the best software, but nothing's going to happen. And the classic case I keep on coming back to is every time I press my TV controller or the up channel and it jumps up 10 channels instead of one, I know that somebody did not understand switch bounce. <laughs> <laughs> so even simple switches can be a problem. Okay, yeah, we've got a great question that's uh, come in. Well, we've got many great questions, actually. Uh, it's going to be difficult wading through them all. Uh, so uh, in the current scenario, when eSIMs are also prevailing, how do you see iSIM influencing the market? And will there be an overlap period while trends, uh, trends shift from eSIM to iSIM? And I'm not going to make everyone answer it, but if you want to answer, just wave your hand and I'll say, you know, ah, one. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, maybe the, this question is better for, for Lloyd to answer. I just wanted to, to give my opinion based on my experience. I think, um, I think there won't be, um, we have been waiting for the eSIM for years, you know, for years to have this eSIM been um, adopted by the M MNOs. And this hasn't really happened as fast as we want. So the iSIM came in. So for me, the transition will be from, uh, from SIM, you know, the big transition will happen directly from SIM to iSIM. That's, that's my opinion, based on what I have seen. And, and the devices we do at Flex, there's really few devices who are being used in eSIM today, and iSIM is coming in and getting much more interest. And I give Lloyd the, the word because he has <laughs> not sure much more to say on that. I feel sorry for the people who put all that work into eSIM. <laughs> 
No, I think, uh, you know, uh, eSIM was a tough transition for the MNOs because that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving up effectively an asset that you were in control of and, and lending some of the responsibility of the network authentication to the OEM who would own this eSIM, would own and operate this eSIM. And we've seen the first of that happening with the car use case, right, which was re really the driver behind eSIM originally. And so uh, that took time to really establish the processes, right, related to how to manage an eSIM, establish the platform at the MNO, at the OEM, etc. But this was really the tough transition. You really have to see uh, eSIM to iSIM as a change in form factor, right? And that's really the key message I want to apply in there is it's a change in form factor that is the functionality, the capabilities, the security certification apply in the same way from an eSIM to an integrated SIM, right? We, we take the same security measure and insurance and we have, when it's relevant, the same remote management capabilities, right? So there, uh, I think the transition is mostly done for the MNO and to, to one's point, uh, the first project that we see on, on, on integrated SIM are most of the time running a classical SIM profile function, right? One unique connectivity provider to start with, because that's good enough to start. And then at the, the deployment scale, uh, and uh, an OEM wants to do multi country with multiple MNOs, then they implement the remote SIM provisioning capabilities. And, and I would say, Something more, you know, on, on there is an, an additional add-on which is um, already, uh, you know, is, is provided by the silicon vendors. So if if your modem has already the iSIM integrated, so you don't have to wor worry about adding sh should I take an eSIM or a SIM or a plastic SIM. You know? So you have already the the iSIM there. So you just have to to use it. You know, so it's it's another enabler, I would say, you know, towards to 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 promote or to facilitate the the um, ICM penetration. Mm. And okay. maybe Max, a final point on this one, but I would say for the end OEM, they don't necessarily already care, right? As long as the connectivity is there, it's ready, it's working. That's all that really matters, right? So the way it's operated and managed should be relatively transparent to the one we implement, and that's what we are trying to to get to. All right. Well, I'd like to say that I'd never been uh, involved in a project that failed, but if I did, I'd be lying, I'm afraid. Uh, so what are the most common reasons for IoT projects that fail, uh, that fail to reach the scale in their financial objectives? I can answer that one or, or start us off here. This is an area um, that we really focus on and double click on a lot with our surveys. And if I had to characterize it, it, going back to something earlier I said, I, I said one sort of class of, of reasons things really fail to get off the ground and scale is that lack of proper planning and collaboration in the upfront stages, ensuring the right stakeholders are at the table. Um, business case, objectives, outcomes are, are sort of laid out there and, and able to be tracked. That would be one class of, of, of reasons. Uh, on the other side are, are pure technical complexity challenges and, and to that also cost. So, um, you know, the, 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 these uh, companies get their sleeves rolled up and once they start to really understand the, um, the full picture of what it will take to, to scale these to thousands and tens of thousands, um, cost and, and, and overall solution complexity um, gets in the way, quite frankly. And then the, the third thing I would put in there are skills as well. So just not having the right skill set uh, on internal teams to be able to take the projects to the next level um, mm -hmm. is often a reason given why why things slow down or th or things even stop for that matter. Yeah, hardware is hard. That's, <laughs> that's the one mantra that I actually live by. And this. I don't know, maybe like maybe the other people have a better but like sort of follow-up question like why why do companies still insist on building their own devices like is there just no device in the market like don't they fulfill whatever they want is it just because people in cto office are bored and and this they feel this is a good good way to spend their time that 
I'm still wondering about that. We have seen this everywhere, literally. Like from the telco that I was working in, all of a sudden we started yeah. to be building our own devices rather than buying it to, yeah, to companies well, that are yeah. not hardware companies. Good, good question, John. And I would say that there is now this has has been changed a little bit over the years, um, and it's, it was like you 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 were saying, you know, before everybody wanted to design their own device, you know, a new device from scratch, and then when they when they saw it was uh, too expensive, they said, "Whoa, this is 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 very expensive." But it's only a small device, yeah, yeah. But this, you, you have to go through all the process if you that, that you make another normal device. Um, and now I think many have moved to the other end. That uh, just provide me a device you have on the show me a device on on a catalog that is doing exactly what I'm looking for, not more and not less, exactly that one. So. And 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 this is also not possible. You know, you have to to take something which is similar or is flexible, and then customize this to your needs. We'll we'll always have some costs, you know, but you don't need to have all the skills in in house. That's what uh, Brian said. That this is one of the failures uh, sometimes. Um, but you have, I think, it's, it's critical that you have really a, a clear business model of what you want to do and where you want to go. You know, is is this business model you? For this IoT solution you are thinking about, do you have a business model for that? Do you, ha, have you thought in in the ROI? You no. Know, what do you want to achieve? Is this bringing your you no know, more revenue? Is bringing more custom fidelization? How do you want to measure that? I think there's a lack of. In in the last year there has been a, like a, you know, we have to do IoT. That's that's what everybody's doing. You know, let's do IoT. Mm. Um, and I, I think actually, there's a question that's come in that's exactly related to this discussion. Uh, is the I, iSIM technology available for OEM use? Uh, and then in brackets, can I buy a chipset and make my own product? Yeah, so I can take that. Uh, uh, I would say yes, right? Uh, because we iSIM is, is made of an ecosystem of partners, right, to enable the technology. So Kigen works on the OS, the services, the data generation of uh, putting the credential of uh, an iSIM into the chipset. But effectively, uh, companies uh, that we partner with, such as Altair and Murata, right, which are integrated, for example, in the iEnable board, they build modules, cellular modules, which integrate a chipset with the iSIM technology. And this is available today from Murata, as an example, right? And we have uh, further partners that we work with who are enable, enabling this type of, uh, of solutions. Uh, I can quote notably sequence, for example, with uh, an LP1 module provider as well. So yes, and, and I think the, the key point I would make to that is to say, we want to build this ready to connect Lego bricks. Rather than have, I have to pick a chipset, put that into my board, put the, select a SIM, etc. Well, go look at the pre-integrated components and or device and or POC devices, right? Before mm -hmm. jumping head on into the technology. That's fun to do, but that's not necessarily the, the fastest way to get a, a proof point on your ROI and on your deployment. Oh, sure. I mean, if I wanted right. to implement yeah. USB on something, I wouldn't go off and design my own interface. <laughs> Like actually, maybe maybe a very short follow-up question. Like, what what are the requirements in silicon to do iSIM? Is it just a secure enclave, or is it a specific piece of silicon that that needs to be laid out? Uh, yeah, good point, uh, Jan. So uh, it's uh, a secure enclave, effectively, right? It it really also depends on the use case you want to achieve. Effectively, if you want to achieve uh, an iSIM for a single MNO or a pretty fine set of MNO, or if you want to be able to go wide footprint with all the biggest MNOs and meet GSMA criteria. But the fundamental is with the cellular chipset, a, a secure enclave, a dedicated secure processor that, that runs the OS. Yeah. Could it, could it theoretically just run on any V8M secure enclave, or is it like really special? Uh, V8M is one option, but that would not necessarily uh, meet as is, uh, let's say, the GSMA requirement. For example, if you want remote profile uh, capabilities, uh, remote profile management. So it can work, and we've seen deployment like that uh, using V8M type of architecture and TE, right? But when we work with our partners, notably for wide scale and tier one compatibility, it's a dedicated secure enclave included, right? 
provided by multiple technology vendors, by the way. It's not only ARM that delivers that, right? Okay, uh, let's look at some use cases because we've got quite a few questions coming in use case related. Um, so we've got one question on the IoT, iSIM and machine learning in retail use cases, uh, in stores and things. So how does the edge work with these services? You want to take that one, uh, Jan? I mean, I can I can comment on the on the ML side. Um, yeah, tell, yeah. There's a couple of, of yeah. I mean, naturally, like the one thing pops in everyone's mind. I think Arm did a demo of this at um, at TechCon two years ago. Is inventory management and um, and keeping track of stuff, keeping track asset tracking in general in the warehouse. Um, people counting is really cool. We start seeing kind of devices that are n running on a microcontroller and being able to do computer vision applications. So you can it's really easy to kind of retrofit a camera in your store that actually knows how busy it is at every time. Um, so that's that's for me kind of the really cool stuff. Like how ISIM fits in, I'll I'll defer to uh, to Loiker on. Yeah, uh, maybe one of the use cases I really like is, for example, you know, uh, uh, checking uh, mechanical conditions on how to reach equipment. Let's say you take uh, a pipeline or a pipe or any sort, and you can or a machine, right? And you don't, you cannot modify the machine, right? You cannot touch it. You cannot install an infrastructure in your factory. Well, you just plug a sensor that will detect vibration. You put some of uh, Yang's magic into that, right? And you can detect when uh, effectively a dangerous uh, event would occur that could damage the machine, as an example, a specific pattern in the vibration, a specific, you know, and and you just slide that in on the side of the machine and off you go. You don't need the specific infrastructure development deployment. You use the cellular available network closing your factory. And that's an over the top use case that I really like. Yeah, and I think the, the very last thing you said is really cool. You know, I've been building embedded device for a long time. There's nothing more annoying than having multiple SKUs for different regions. And put an ISM in, remote SIM provisioning, global SKU, that saves so much hassle and so much time and so much energy already. And that, that is applicable to any uh, any application. Yeah. So so that's where I think the cellular aspect is really strong because it's it delivers this ubiquitous coverage that you need, that you have in most places yeah. where you actually need service. I think that's already the, yeah. the important point compared to other technology. Yeah. But I think the yeah. remote stream provisioning here is 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 the coolest thing addition, right? Then it's really just you take it out of the box, put it on, and say so. But this, I think this is uh, the, the 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 icing comes with the cellular, and and I think the cellular connectivity is is we are we we used to see the cellular connectivity in solutions where you don't have Wi-Fi. You know, no, we have to use cellular because it's global. We don't have Wi-Fi here, or we don't have a smartphone to use Bluetooth. I think the cellular is going to penetrate on these on these areas as well in the consumer, you know, and and get rid of of the of the smartphone as a gateway, getting rid of the of the Wi-Fi as a as a gateway, because it it opened up a, a lot of other possibilities, you know. In the past, cellular was very expensive, you know, very difficult to configure and sim uh, sim uh, plastic sim you have to provide etc. But if you have all these uh, building blocks together. And, and as the, the cellular, uh, you know, to move to the 5G technology, so the, the resources on the network for, for narrowband IoT are, you know, with this, um, um, you know, dynamic uh, frequency uh, assignment will be less, less expensive for the MNOs to, to lower the prices of this connectivity, the hardware is going down. So ha having a, a, a cellular connection on the, on the consumer devices, it opens up a, a lot of possibilities for, for the customer. Because you you forget about the device is connected automatically, but mainly for for the for the OEM. So you you forget about I mean you don't depend on the customer anymore that uh, the customer decided to connect your washing machine to the Wi-Fi or not that the, the customer has changed the the, the Wi-Fi password and then the washing machine is not connected anymore or that mm -hmm. the smartphone has no battery to to so you have 
uh, you know when the device is connected for the first time because the device connects automatically to your cloud and you have direct access to your device so you have a you know a, a, a cleaning machine or whatever so you can monitor this remotely how the customer is using your device you can do a predictive maintenance so you can see oh this uh, this um, machine is going to break so i can i can take the initiative and send a, a repair part to the customer and with instructions how to change it or send some technical support so uh, you have a customer which is happy with you because you know have a, a solution that uh, has no 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 problems anymore so the devices get always working or and in, you can wash your clothes yeah in europe we we see we see now uh, you know more and more this um um device or pay per use so you have a washing machine and you don't buy the washing machine you pay you pay uh, for for every watch you use and, and the, the oem owns the machine and provides the the detergent everything so having connective cellular connectivity and that gives you much more control of your devices okay now we're, we're getting close to the end here so uh, i've got a question here that's i think pretty interesting do current cellular providers att vodafone etc support reprogramming the iSIM as the product transits from one transits transits from one network to another can anyone answer that one so we are working on that with all the tier ones i mean all right the the first deployment we 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 see and uh, you've seen a lot of communication maybe around uh, vodafone participation for example on that uh, or at and has published some uh, uh, initiative around integrated sim right so today uh, the first project are a single profile but uh, the gsma i think the important point is the gsma has defined the rules uh, actually back in march uh, to which uh, you can certify an integrated sim right for multi-profile capabilities and we are working uh, notably uh, for example with sequence uh, to such a remotely provisionable uh, integrated sim which can be certified according to gsma right and and the tier one uh, mnos uh, were engaged into that discussion on how such a product would be certified so they they, they vetted it uh, by uh, voting yes in in the gsma uh, uh, votes uh, for that so uh, you can deploy a single profile i think today and uh well i would say towards end of year you can deploy remotely manageable uh integrated sim uh with some tier one mnos already yeah. okay i think we've got time for just one more question uh while i ask this question our panel members have told me that uh, you can feel free to contact them directly using the contact details that will appear on your screens in a, a moment uh, so the final question, and I've sort of got a, a, a sneaking feeling that Juan's going to jump on this one. How will the arrival of 5G impact the IoT industry? What well, I mean, I just give a, a quick answer. I think I mentioned already. You know, the, the nowadays uh, the narrowband IoT and CATM solutions they've cost a lot of resources to the to the to the mobile operators using the 4G network infrastructure with the 5g uh, there is one of the technologies in the 5g is uh, the frequency dynamic frequency uh, uh, which uh, acquisition so it means you can they can assign empty spaces on the on the time and frequency space to um, empty spaces to to your uh, small packets of data so the cost uh, i think the, the cost of of the connectivity for iot with 5g will shoot <laughs> should uh, decrease with the time with the 5g and i give the, the to brian he wanted to say something as well. yeah I, I just add for so first thing to say is that the uh iot friendly variants of 4g nb and ltm are actually pulled forward and supported in the 5g standard so that's important to note the other thing that's coming online is the fact that you know the the performance of 5g is actually going to make it um a viable alternative for wired networks, especially in these industrial locations. So the idea of being able to support, um, you know, a, a tremendous sort of spectrum of workloads from a single physical deployment of radio uh, and spectrum and so forth is extremely attractive as a disruptive opportunity there. 
And of course, the, the device density of 5G will be, you know, things like WIFO won't be able to come close to it. You're talking about being able to support um, a million concurrent devices um, on a single AP, uh, so a million per square kilometer. So the device density, support for time sensitive and deterministic network, uh, all these things together make 5G, you know, an important um, enabler over the next 10 years or so. Uh, we truly do live in exciting times. I, I cannot wait to see where we're going to be in five years' time and 10 years' time and everything. Um, okay, so thank you so much. The great answers there to great questions. Uh, for those of you who posted questions that weren't answered, uh, we're going to forward those to the members of the panel so that they'll follow you up with you later. Uh, as a reminder, this recording is going to be available for on-demand viewing starting tomorrow, where it will be found on IoT Central, that's IOC iotcentral.io. Uh, and I'm afraid that brings today's webinar to a close. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and for your thoughtful questions. A special thanks once again to Keegan for their sponsorship, as well as to our panel members, Loic, Jan, Juan and Brian for their insights. Uh, once again, this is Max Maxfield. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event, and I look forward to seeing you all on the next IoT Central webinar. So until then, from all of us here at IoT Central, uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.